All right, let's get started. Welcome to Concrete Design. Um, a couple brief announcements right at the beginning. Um, first off, I, I got to break myself of that habit because, you know, I, I think what would happen in structural analysis is say, all right, let's get started, and then let me get the sign-in sheet passed around. You know, every, every day. Well, I, I've decided to not take attendance this semester, so um, this is a senior level class. Y'all are grown adults. So I'm just not going to worry about it. Um, the only thing I'll say is this. Uh, I am going to continue to record lectures uh, just as long as everybody's generally coming. They're going to be recorded and posted to YouTube. Y'all know the drill. Um, a couple other brief announcements, and then I'm going to talk about the syllabus, talk about the class, and then we'll, uh, we'll get right into it. Yes? No. <laughs> You're grown. <laughs> All right. Remember, you got me three times this semester. <laughs> um, yeah. Tell you, do you want to just do it at the end, or because I already got? No, I want that room. I was gonna. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, it, it started at ten. I didn't even think about oh, that. So. Right. So, so after today, we'll just switch, or? In fact, if you want to go over there now, I'm done. So. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll do this for a little bit, and then we'll switch. Thank you. I appreciate it. So just so everybody know what that's about, um, we have, con right now, the way the schedule is set up, we have concrete design in here and steel design over there. I don't know. That was the professor who's in that room. So after after today, we're going to meet in there for concrete design. So that anybody who's in concrete and steel will just stay in the same room. Makes sense, right? Yep. So we'll um, we'll do that. Uh, I tell you what, we'll just we'll just complete lecture today in here, and then we'll just move over, and then from here on out, we'll meet over there. Sound good? All right. Okay. Um, a couple other brief announcements. Uh, I'm going to ha uh, be canceling class next Wednesday, okay? I'm going to be out of town for the uh, first part of that week uh, for a uh, research conference. So on Wednesday, I'll be in a plane. So I won't be here. So next Wednesday, we won't be here. So next week, you all are going to get a break from Dr. Mike because we won't be here Monday for the holiday and we won't be here Wednesday. Um, your first homework assignment is will be assigned on Friday. So for now, just relax and absorb some of this wonderful uh, reinforced concrete design. You all know that, that I uh, uh, fill my classes with a lot of cheesy puns. I will try and crack you up throughout the semester. Concrete design crack up. Ha, ha, ha. No, no. no. That's, just wait. Just wait. Um, okay. So other than that, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and get right into the, uh, uh, the presentation, get into the, the grade and the syllabus and all that. Okay. So uh, First off, let's just talk about the grade, just so everybody's aware uh, of how the grade is, is assigned. So because I'm not taking attendance, it's just homeworks and exams. Uh, there's, uh, there's nine homework assignments in here, uh, and I'll talk about the schedule here in a second. But the homework's worth 40%, and then each of the exams uh, are worth 20 apiece. Uh, that's the textbook. Um, I'll say this about the textbook. Uh, you know. I do think you need a good reinforced concrete design reference, and this is a, a pretty good one. Um, I mainly get a lot of homework from this. Uh, so for instance, on some of your homework assignments, I'll say problem 814, but with these adjustments and whatnot. Um, if you use an older edition, or if you and your friends decide to pull together and buy one, that's fine. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, as long as you're getting the homeworks done, that's fine. So, I have no problem with that. I really don't. I mean, they're they're you can rent soft copies for, for like thirty bucks. You know, I have no problem with that at all. And this in this course, you don't really need the book for exams like you do in steel design. You you have to have the manual. There's there's really no way of getting around steel design without it. But in here, 
That's not really the case. A lot of what we do in this class, we sort of derive our own equations just because of the nature of reinforced concrete design. So if you want, again, if you want to pull together, if you want to get a, a so, uh, you know, purchase a soft copy or something like that, I, I, I'm completely fine, whatever. As long as I, you're getting the homeworks done, that's all I care about. So, sound good? Um, so let's talk about uh, that. Like I said, I'm not taking attendance this semester. Um, you, you all are grown-ups, so just make sure that you're, you know, uh, 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 you know, attentive and engaged. And this is really going to be more of a bigger deal in steel design because there's 48 people in the room. What I don't want is somebody to show up 20 minutes late and then they're sitting where he is, so they've got to like squeeze by like seven people, you know, 20 minutes into class. Like if you're going to be that late, just don't come. It's not as big of a deal in here, but in there, that's going to kind of be, be a big deal. Um, I'm still recording, so you all know that I've got the little microphone on right now. Uh, all of the lectures are going to be uh, screen captured and uh, posted to YouTube. Uh, I am going to be doing the problems on the screen. So, for instance, you know, if you ever see me click the pen, then one note pops up, and then I can, you know, Whatnot. So I'm going to be doing the problems here just like I have in, in, uh, in previous semesters and whatnot. Um, Blackboard. Let me show you what's going on with Blackboard real, real quick because I've done a lot of work uh, on our course page over break and they're pretty much everything for the class is, is set up and ready to go. So uh, here's Blackboard. Let me enter student preview so it kind of looks like what you see. Um, so if you go to course content, uh, the syllabus is uploaded and up to date. Uh, this is a link to the YouTube playlist, so uh, once this video uh, gets processed, usually that day or maybe the day after, I'll add it to the playlist. So obviously there's nothing there now, but um, you'll see everything uh, there. Uh, old homework assignments, once uh, you all turn in an assignment, I'll post the homework and the solution uh, in here. And if you go into lecture notes and supplements, that's everything. This is the entire course. Everything's uploaded and ready to go. So I've got all the lecture note handouts, all the design aids, and all the exam review slides are already set up and ready to go. So, um, so it's all here. So like I said, I'm trying to be super green this semester. In fact, I think the only thing that I will print off uh, other than exams are some of these design aids and supplements, but I'm going to hold off until it becomes relevant. For instance, we probably won't use this beam design aid until something like week four or five, and then the beam column aid we won't use until the very, very end. So there's no real need to print it off now. Okay. Um, the only other thing, uh, homeworks and exams. Um, uh, I'll assign the homework during lecture. It's typically due one week after it's assigned, but there, uh, some of the assignments I give you a little bit more time. Uh, let me pull up the syllabus. So here, here's the syllabus, and if you scroll down to the end, I have a schedule pretty similar to, uh, to what's, uh, what you see what you've seen last semester, let's say, in structural analysis. Um, a, a couple things about this schedule. Uh, for those of you that are also in steel design, I've made it a point to ensure that tests are not on the same week. So if there's a test in, so for instance, I think exam one, uh, that's, I think that's a typo right there because this is, yeah, that's where exam one's supposed to be. I'll fix that. This is, this is the exam one date in here. It says course overview. I'll fix that and re-upload. But this is where exam one is for us in concrete design and in steel design, I believe it's the week prior. Um, I've also done my best to try and ensure that homeworks are not due on the same day. Sometimes that does happen, particularly here in the beginning uh, and also near the end because like the last homework assignment for both courses is due on May 3rd. Um, but uh, one thing I will say is uh, uh, for all the other assignments, the, the homeworks are fairly staggered. So you'll have homework, let's say, one week due on Friday and then in another class is due the following Monday. So I, I do my best to try and not load you down if you're in both of my classes. A, because then I have a stack I, I've got to go through uh, myself. So uh, I've done my best to try and, uh, and work that out. Uh, Let's see, what else is worth mentioning in terms of the schedule? Oh, um, I have a couple makeup days listed in the class. So for instance, Friday, March 22nd is a makeup day. That's if for some reason we have inclement weather or we're behind or anything like that. But if we're on time and we're rocking and rolling, this is the day before spring break, I'll cancel class. Unless you are that excited about reinforced concrete design. 
Not, okay, all right, let's see how this works. All right, um, I can't really think of anything else. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Oh, I do have, I do have one thing I want to mention. Um, uh, it's about math, and it's about the math requirements for the class. Last semester, we saw it, it was one of those classes where the C word popped up, a little bit of calculus. That's pretty much not going to be the case in here. Um, if you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide, you're good. Um, I will say, though, the, the one thing that is going to pop up are unit conversions. That, that's going to pop up in here. Okay, So put it on your formula sheet, practice it, do whatever you got to do, but unit conversions will pop up. Okay, You will have a KSI being multiplied by cubic inches, and I want foot tips at the end. So that type of stuff's going to happen. So I, I'm telling you that now. Uh, just, just to prepare you for it. But other than that, the math in here is fairly simple. Add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Um, occasional square root, you know, that, that's it. So, um, and, and steel design, that's the same thing. The only other thing worth mentioning in steel design is you need to be able to linearly interpolate. But that, that will pop up quite a bit uh, in there. But other than that, that's, that's pretty much it. So, any questions? All right, then I say we go ahead and, and, and get started, and let's start talking a little bit about design. Um, in this course, the, the main focus and the main goal uh, of what we're trying to do is to safely design structures made out of reinforced concrete. So we're talking about buildings and bridges, and uh, those, those structures are made out of beams and columns and slabs and all sorts of different structural elements. I guess my first question is, how in the heck do we do that? I mean, we know from last semester, we know from structural analysis how to analyze a structure. So uh, you've got a beam with some loads on it. You all should be able to draw shear diagrams and moment diagrams to determine bending moments and things like that. Well, that's great, Dr. Mike, but we didn't really care then. Why do we care now, right? That was a joke, not very funny. But, but in all seriousness, how exactly do we go about ensuring that a structure is, is safe? Okay? How do we do that? Well, that begins the dis one of the first discussions uh, in a structural engineering course, which is the concept of a design philosophy, okay? uh, a, a concept or a means by which we ensure safety uh, in structural systems. Now, in engineering practice today, there are two philosophies uh, that are utilized. Uh, that, that pretty much uh, uh, that, that you'll see in practice. One of them is allowable strength design, and one of them is load and resistance factor design. If you want a direct reference to that, if anybody just happens to have their steel manual with them, uh, if you're in that course, just open up the steel manual and start flipping through it. Okay? When you open up the steel manual, you'll start flipping through it. You'll see a bunch of tables, and some of them will have green numbers and blue numbers. They do that because in, in steel design, they actually still use both philosophies. So the green numbers reference ASD and the blue numbers represent LRFD. Uh, in concrete design, we pretty much only use uh, LRFD. And I'm going to explain why here in a little bit. We're also only going to use LRFD uh, in steel. But let's just sort of break it down. Okay? So allowable stress design is the more historic method of design. And it, by and large, is the simplest approach to, uh, uh, to designing a, a structural system. So here's how ASD works, okay? So let's say that a member has a computed capacity or a nominal capacity of 100 kips. Now what I mean by nominal capacity uh, is this. I go down to the lab and I like breaking things because my general philosophy is any day with controlled demolition is a good day. So I go down to the lab and I, I put, let's say, a, a reinforced concrete column under a big actuator and I start loading it and loading it and loading it until the thing breaks. And let's say it breaks at a load of uh, 100 kips. Okay? Well, let me give you a, 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 a little bit more of a, a grounded example. How many of you uh, have gone to Walmart and bought that particle board furniture for your dorm rooms or your apartments or whatnot and you put it together and you got the entertainment center that costs 30 bucks, right? And the, you know, there's the little label on top of it that says, warning, do not put more than 200 pounds on this, right? right? Well, what ends up happening is um, if you actually go and take that entertainment center and put it under you know, the actuator, again, any day with controlled demolition is a good day, 
and you go and you, you fail it, let's say it fails at 400 pounds. So 400 pounds, that thing's cracking in half. Well, if you're the manufacturer of that entertainment center, you might say, you know what, I don't want to tell people, well, it can actually hold up 400 pounds, so the capacity's 400 pounds. Maybe what I'll do is say, well, it breaks at 400 pounds, why don't I back that off and say, don't put any more than 200 pounds on it. What I've done is I've employed what's called a factor of safety, right? I have to believe at this point you all have at least heard that term before, right? So a factor of safety is a difference between, uh, or is, is the ratio between uh, a member's nominal capacity, what will actually cause it to fail, and its allowable capacity, okay? Hence the term allowable strength design or allowable stress design. So if I employ, let's say, a factor of safety of two, going back to, let's say, that reinforced concrete column, if the column can actually hold up a capacity of uh, 100 kips, it can actually hold that up before it fails, I might say, no, 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 I'm going to back that off a bit. I'm going to use a factor of safety of two, and uh, let's say its allowable strength would be uh, 50 kips. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, here's, th th that's fine, and, and I would argue if you were uh, trying, if you were on Mars trying to develop a, a, a structural design philosophy and you had absolutely no knowledge about how Martian concrete was going to behave, well then that might be a, a reasonable approach. The problem is, is that, that that's really not a scientific means uh, and, and a reliable means uh, of designing structures. And I use that word reliable very, very carefully. Okay? The main disadvantage of allowable strength design is that it doesn't take into account the concept of uncertainties. So what do I mean by uncertainties? Okay, let's take this table. Okay, let's go back to the, to the breaking you know, uh, example. I go down to the lab and I put this under a, uh, an actuator and I apply load until it fails. And let's say that this table right here breaks at exactly 800 pounds. Do you think that if I did the same thing to this table that it would break at 800 pounds? Exactly 800 pounds. No, maybe this one fails at 805. Maybe this one fails at 786. Maybe this one fails at 824. Maybe this one fails at 783, right? The average may be around uh, 800 pounds, but there's going to be some scatter, right? There's going to be some uncertainty. There's going to be some no a little bit of noise in that data. Well. One of the problems with ASD is that it does not take into account the concept of uncertainty. There is uncertainty associated with the resistance uh, of this table, just like there is uncertainty associated with, with strength of reinforced concrete for a number of reasons. Uh, let's take material quality. Do you think that this, this plank, that uh, this table surface, has the exact same material properties as this one? No, right? I mean, anybody who's had CE321 knows, I mean, you had groups mixing concrete cylinders, and you, you test them, and they don't have the same strength. They're close, but they're not, you know? They're not exact. Um, there's issues with fabrication tolerances. There's issues with construction, okay? I would argue that even if this table was uh, 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 manufactured in a factory, that a human being put it together, and there's uncertainties in how tight the bolts are in this table versus this table. Just as there are uncertainties in the placement of rebar and slabs in buildings. There's just, there's, there's a lot of uncertainties that you need to be able to characterize that ASD doesn't, okay? There's also a whole host of uncertainties associated on the load side. And there's a number of different loads that we're gonna talk about in here. For instance, how certain are you about the pressures that a building experiences when wind hits it? You know, one day is windier than the other, right? What about snow load, right? You know, snow load, you could have a heavy snow day one day and a light snow day the other. What about live loads? What about us? You know, we are applying a gravity load to the floor. After we leave, another class is going to come in here and have a, a whole different set of loads. Make sense? So there's a whole bunch of uncertainties associated with, uh, uh, with loads and resistances that ASD really doesn't account for. But... LRFD does, or at least does to as simple of a scientific approach uh, that it can. Uh, basically, LRFD tries to account for statistical uncertainties, and it does that through the use of what are called reliability-based methods, hence that, that word reliability. I was, I was using that word very carefully. Okay? Now, going back to the tables, you would agree that if I tested all the tables in this room, 
I would have, let's say, a mean standard deviation, right? Remember that whole bell curve, right? Well, I propose that if I could determine a mean and a standard deviation for the strength of these tables, I could plot a curve, right? Just as I could collect data on the loads on a structure, the mean and standard deviation, and I could come up with some curves representing uh, basically what's going on uh, in, in, in a structural system. Now, admittedly, this curve is, is pretty simple because all we have is just one load and one strength. And, and in reality, there's a lot more going on. So for instance, if we're designing, let's say, a, a parking garage, there's dead loads, there's live loads, there's snow loads, you know, wind, maybe if we were in California, we'd have to deal with earthquake loads uh, and things like that. So there's a whole bunch of stuff different going on. But generally, what we're after when we uh, perform a structural design is something like this. So I've got two bell curves. Everybody familiar with bell curve? Everybody remember that? Okay. So I have a bell curve here, this, this red one, this one on the left. That represents the loads on the structure. And then this blue one, this one over here on the right, represents the resistance. Okay. Now there's a couple things to take away from, from this plot. First off, the resistance curve is over here. So the resistance curve is on the right and the loads are on the left. Okay. Now, now this is the x-axis. So if this curve is over here on the right, it generally means that the resistances on average are bigger than the loads. Right. Now, I would hope that's the case because what that mean, what that means is that the structures on average are stronger than the loads that we're putting on them. If it was the other way around, that would mean that the loads are on average bigger than what the structure can hold up and that would be a bad day, right? That would mean that the bridge is going in the river, right? So on average, we want the resistance to be over here on the right. Make sense? Now, another thing that, that's a little more subtle but if you notice the resistance curve, see how it's a little skinnier and taller than the load curve? The load curve is, is a little shorter and a little wider. There's a reason for that. The shape of this curve, so, so the location uh, left to right is defined by the average or the mean. The shape of the curve is defined by the standard deviation. The fact that this blue curve is taller and skinnier means it generally has a smaller standard deviation. Okay, this is a little bit more of a subtle point, but this really should be what we're what we're after, because what this means is is that there's less scatter in the resistance data that there is in the load data. In other words, the resistance data it's a little bit closer together, but that kind of makes sense if you think about it, because the resistance that's how strong the structure is. We should have control over that, right? We're the ones building the structure, so we should have more control over the resistance and the loads. I don't have any control at all over how fast the wind decides to blow one day. But I do have control over how far apart my rebar are or the QAQC measures I take in proportioning the mix design. I have more control over that than I do how heavy the snow is one day. So generally the resistance curve should be a little skinnier and a little taller. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I've got the resistances and I've got the loads. So the resistances are R, the loads are Q. I can take these two and come up with a third one by just subtracting them. So this is R minus Q. So the resistances minus the loads. And when I do that, I get an image that looks something like this. Okay? Now, there's a, there's a lot going on here, so I, I, wanna, I wanna take a look at this. So this is this new curve. This is R minus Q, okay? And if you look here, this R minus Q, I got some of this curve that trails over here to the left of the axis, but most of it trails over here. Okay? On average, that Z value is positive. In other words, R minus Q is positive. That's a good thing, because if R minus Q is positive, what does that mean? That means that R is bigger than Q, right? That means the resistances are bigger than the loads. That's what we want, right? But if you remember from probability and statistics, these bell curves, they go on forever, right? It goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, right? If you think about structural engineering in those terms, you can never design a structure that's perfectly safe. It's impossible because the bell curves go on forever. You can never design a structure that's perfectly safe. 
But what you can do is you can try and manage that. This area over here on the left, that's the probability of failure. Okay? Everything over here, this is an instance where the resistance is smaller than the load, and this would be a representation of when the structure is unsafe. Okay? So instead of looking at structural engineering as, well, you know, structures are either safe or they're not, we recognize, well, we can never design a structure that's perfectly safe, but what we can do is develop a philosophy that ensures a uniform level of safety. Okay? And we're going to talk about uh, some, some caveats to this later. For instance, uh, one of the things that changes our design approach is the type of structure that we design. So for instance, we would design uh, a grain silo differently that we would design the trauma wing in a hospital. Because if the trauma wing in the hospital fails, that's going to affect a lot more people than a grain silo out in the middle of nowhere. So we're going to, there, there are going to be some differences in this, but, but by and large what we're trying to do is ensure a uniform level of safety. Now, the way that we measure that uniform level of safety is, what's, is through what's called a reliability index. Basically this term beta is how many standard deviations we are away from the axis. So uh, without getting too deep into statistics land, what I'll say is this. This term beta, uh, it can change depending upon what you're looking at. So for instance, uh, when you're designing main members, uh, usually you're targeting a beta value of around three. Whereas if you're designing, let's say, connections, you're targeting, targeting a beta value of around four. Now, the reason why is because if a connection fails, that's where two or more members meet. So if a connection fails, that's a lot of members failing. Whereas main member design, you're only dealing with one. Does that make sense? Now, this might seem complicated. Uh, it's really not complicated in practice. The only point I really want to get across uh, is this right here. Um, this was a study done uh, back when LRFD was first being proposed for the, uh, for the bridge industry. And what you'll find is they were looking at a series of uh, highway bridges and they were computing these reliability indices before we applied LRFD and after. And what you can see is that the reliability of structures is just far more uniform when we use LRFD. So, not really a big deal in here. In steel design, you're provided the option. What I'm trying to do is convince you that LRFD is the way to go because in the end, you're going to be designing safe and reliably safe, I guess should be the, uh, the words I use, reliably safe uh, systems every time. As long as you apply it properly, you're pretty much never going to have an issue. Now, the way that LRFD works, and if I'm throwing a lot of details at you, don't worry. The stuff that I'm talking about today is stuff that we are going to be using every day for the rest of the semester. Basically, in LRFD, what we do is we apply different factors to the loads and resistance separately. So we compute nominal resistance, and we adjust them by resistance factors. And we compute nominal loads, we adjust them by, uh, by load factors. Don't worry, we're going to take this one step at a time. For instance, these nominal resistances, we're going to spend the entire semester computing nominal resistance. So we'll have an MN, a nominal moment capacity, a VN, a nominal shear capacity, you know, and, and so on and so forth. We're going to be doing this all semester. And for dead loads, a, a lot of this is going to come from some pretty basic structural analysis stuff uh, that you all learned. Uh, last semester whenever you took structural analysis. So, so far so good? Okay. Now, um, this equation is basically what this entire course is all, is all about. I know the box up top seems a little complicated. It's really just a fancy way of saying that when it's all said and done, your resistances need to be greater than or equal to your loads. In other words, the strength of the structure has to be larger or equal to whatever force you're putting on it. Make sense? I, I think that's, it, it's lo let's put it like this. If you understand that and if you're able to ensure that, that is structural engineering in a nutshell. And that is what we're doing in here. Um, the only other point I'll mention uh, about this class, and this is true of steel design in general,
but um, what we do in here and what we do in steel design is probably one of the most uh, uh, professional and real world uh, exercises of civil engineering that there is. I mean, don't get me wrong, statics is important and you need to understand it, but I guarantee you nobody who's worked in a design office has, has been, been looking at uh, contracts or, or, or bid documents or sheet drawings and said, we got to break out the IJK on this one. <laughs> cross-product, not a dot product. It, I mean, look, it, it, it forms a sound conceptual basis, but let's be frank, you don't really use this day in, day out in, in a real world setting. This stuff you do. We're, we're following ACI 318 guidelines in here, so usually on day one, one of the things I like to do is, is I like to say, here's why you're in this class. The reason why you're in this class, this is civil engineering. That's, that's what we're doing. So. That's the, the simplest answer I can give you. You can do this. Th th this is civil engineering. Um, any questions so far? I know I threw a bit of statistics at you. You're like, I wasn't expecting that on the first day. But, uh, but don't worry. It, it's, uh, yes? That, that's a fantastic question. Um, what, what I'll say is this, so I'm, I'm going to repeat it for the recording. The question was, why am I using bell curves? Is there any other distribution I can use? Uh, the short answer is, yeah, there's, there's oodles of different distributions that you can use. And in actual you know, reliability computations, there's a host of different probability distributions that you would use for different loads. For instance, um, dead loads are commonly normally distributed. But you'll find that resistances, a common distribution, is a log normal distribution. And then live loads, you'll see a lot of extreme type 1 distributions used for live loads and whatnot. Um, there is a, structural reliability is a science in and of itself. It's a common course in graduate school, and you talk about this stuff in very significant detail. For the purposes of just trying to explain the concept, since the bell curve is the easiest distribution to understand. It's what I use just for lecture. But you're making a really good point that there's oodles of different distributions that you could use. And for certain load events, other distributions make sense, particularly the ones that are environmental in nature. So like wind and earthquake, they may not fit the bell curve as well as if you used a dumbbell distribution or something like that. So it's good stuff. Sound good? OK. Let's talk about uh, uh, a little bit of a simpler topic, but a much more important topic to discuss, and that's tributary area. You could argue that this is a topic that's more appropriate for structural analysis, but considering that the structural analysis that we do in here is really, really simple compared to what we do in, in 312, uh, I felt it made sense to hold off on this. So, Let's, let's talk about this. Now, now, the reason why I'm mentioning this concept of tributary area is because in order to properly discuss and define for you just what structural design really is, we got to look at this from two sides of the equation. In other words, we want to look at the loads or we want to look at the resistances. So I want to look at the loads first. Now, just to make sure everybody in here is getting a complete picture of what's going on, since I teach both steel design and concrete design, I've decided to split this up a bit. So in here, we're going to discuss gravity loads. And in there, we're going to discuss lateral loads. So between the two, you get the complete picture. Okay? Uh, that way, I'm not doubling up uh, and whatnot. So, when I talk, uh, so let me sort of explain what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about gravity loads, I'm talking about loads that act in the direction of gravity. So dead loads, in other words, the self-weight of a structure, that acts in the direction of gravity. It acts up and down. Live loads, like us, we act in the direction of gravity, up and down. Okay? Whereas something like wind acts this way. Okay? So in there, we're going to talk about wind and then the other big lateral load, which is what? What do you think the other big load acting this way is? Earthquakes, exactly, seismic. Um, whereas in here, we're going to look at dead loads, live loads, and then the other big 
gravity load acting up and down, and that's snow. Okay? Now you might ask, well, what about rain? Well, more often than not, you can handle rain with just proper drainage. It really doesn't add significant load events, other than some instances with snow. But that, that's, that's sort of outside the scope of what we're talking about. But before we get into where you get loads on structures, we need to talk about tributary area. Okay? So tributary area is basically a way of determining how much of a building a certain member is responsible for. So the easiest way to explain it is this. Okay, see it right there? That's a column. See that? That's another column. Okay, so there, there's a column here, there's a column there, there's a column over here, and there's a series of columns holding up this exterior portion of the building. Okay, that column right there, I propose that that column is responsible for all of this halfway over to that one, right? So let's see, maybe about right there, maybe about this line right here on the ceilings. Everybody see that? Okay, every, yeah, see that right there between those two lights? Everything over here, that column is responsible, or, is responsible for, and everything on this side, that column is responsible for. Make sense? That's the general concept of tributary area. So it's basically bound, and more often than not, as the lines halfway adjacent to the next element. So you think you, you take your floor and you divvy it up, and you say, okay, that beam is responsible for halfway over and halfway over. And that's basically how you determine loads on structures. What that process is called uh, performing what's called a load takedown. We're going to do a detailed load takedown uh, probably on, on Wednesday. So Let's say we have a, a generic floor pattern. So what, what I'm looking at right here, this is a, a floor pattern. So I'm in you know, the helicopter looking down. Okay? And so what I see here is I've got these sort of squares. These are the columns. And then I've got girders framing into those columns and beams framing into that. Does that make sense? So I think I have an image here. So it's kind of like this. This is a, a, a photo I took of the Third Avenue parking garage. So these are the columns, then I've got the girders framing into that, and beams framing into the girders. Make sense? Sort of like a hip bone connected to the leg bone type thing. So let's, let's test out my pen. Let's see if my pen works. I'll just leave it here. OK, so let's take, I don't know, that beam right there. OK, I propose that this beam is responsible for all of the floor halfway over to the next one and halfway over to the next one. So I would propose that this beam is responsible for that much floor, right? So that would be the tributary area for this beam. Make sense? So what about, let's say, one of the beams on the edge? like this beam over here between A1 and A2. Well, this floor beam is only responsible for that much. So far, so good? So if we're doing design, I would propose that if all we're looking at is gravity loads, and if we don't have to consider like walls or anything like that, that this beam is only seeing half as much load as this beam. So this beam could probably be a little lighter. Make sense? Sound good? All right. Now that's for the, the beams. If we're talking about, let's say, the girders, let me erase this. So if we're talking about, let's say, that girder right there, well, this girder is responsible halfway over to this one, halfway over to that one. So that would be the tributary area for that girder. Make sense? Generally, girders are a little bit bigger than beams. Look at your next slide. You know, this beam here is a lot deeper and a lot wider, or this girder is a lot deeper and a lot wider than these beams framing into it. Make sense? So that's the beams, that's the girders. If we're looking at columns, let's say we're looking at that column right there. Well halfway over to this one, halfway over to this one, halfway over to that one, and that is the tributary area for that.
for that column. Does that make sense? So the nice thing about tributary area is that divided up properly, well, every element is supporting the floor. If you divide it up properly, the entire floor gets accounted for in a design. So let's say you're designing the columns. So just, just to sort of illustrate this, let's say you're designing the columns. Well, this central column holds up probably like all that, right? And then this column here holds up that portion. This column A1 holds up that portion, etc. So the nice thing about tributary area is that using this principle, the entire floor ends up getting designed for in one way or another. So it's not like there's floor that's not being held up by anything, right? Because that, that would be bad if you're, if you're looking, oh, nothing's holding up that, nothing, yeah, that's bad. Yes? That's a good question. Uh, that's, that's a great question. I'm glad, I'm glad you got into that. Okay, let's talk about that overlapping area issue. Okay, let's take this floor beam right here. Right, oh, let's take that floor beam right here, right? Okay, I would propose that if I'm, ideal, if I'm looking at the analysis of this floor beam, I would probably treat it like you see here on the, uh, on the left, just a beam, let's say, with a uniformly distributed load, right? Okay. So would you agree that this is going to have a reaction here and that's going to have a reaction there? Everybody agree with that? Well, one way to handle that overlapping load is that when you look at this girder, instead of treating this girder as if it has a series of distributed loads on it, what do I have? That, that girder has what? Whoop. That girder has what? One, two, three, four floor beams framing into it, why not design that girder as if those reactions are just point loads? Does that make sense? So here's a, here's a real world example, okay? Let's take a look at this image from the, uh, from the third floor or the third avenue parking garage, okay? Yes? No, I'm saying it has four forces because there's four places where the beams frame into it. See, see what? Exactly, that's exactly right. And we're going to talk about that when we do our example. You're making a good point. So, so let's take a look at this, this girder, okay? I propose that, let's say if we're looking at that floor beam right here, that this floor beam is responsible for all of that floor, and let's say all of that floor, right? So it's got to hold up all of that, right? Now what's, what's this girder right here, what's it gonna experience? It's gonna experience a point load right there, right? So this girder right there is basically gonna see like a point load here, point load here, point load here, point load here, wherever those beams are framing into it. Did that sort of answer your question? So all you're doing, all. What's that? We're, yes, and, and we're going we're gonna to get into that when we do our big example here in a little bit. Now, what Mr. Ham was talking about is what if you have beams carrying out this way? In other words, not only are there beams framing in this way, but there's beams framing in that way as well. You've got to account for both reactions. In other words, this girder experiences a lot less load than that girder. Does that make sense? Don't worry if, if you know, it's day one and you're like, oh, God, what about all this? We're going we're gonna to get into these details very, very significantly uh, when we do our big example. Is this good stuff for, for the first day? Don't worry. When we, um, when we, when we come back on Wednesday, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at a floor system. We're going to look at this floor system, and we're going to do a load takedown of this floor system. So we're going to do this from start to finish. And I think what you're going to find is that this is simple, 
and it really directly relates to what we did in structural analysis. Because what we're going to do is take a representative floor system with a representative load on it and then turn it into this, into what you see here. And this should be familiar from what we did last semester. Like if you can't analyze this structure after what I taught you last semester, man, I failed miserably as a professor. But so, so just so you are aware of where this is going, so just so you're aware, I, I want to show you, because I, I like to give you a little bit of the shape of things to come later. What we're going to do is this. So when we come back Wednesday, I'm going to give you a, we're going to take this floor system and we're going to say, what if it's subjected to a 20 pounds per square foot load? What are the loads on an interior beam, a column, what have you? And say, so we're going to learn those mechanics in class. Then the next thing we're going to ask is, well, where the heck does the 20 PSF come from? Like, how, how did I determine it was 20 PSF and not 60 PSF or 80 PSF? Or where did this stuff come from to begin with? And so we're going to take it one step at a time. And in here, we're going to look at dead loads, live loads, and snow loads. And in there, we're going to do wind and seismic. So between the two, we're going to get the whole picture. Yes? No, that's not changing. That's not changing. Sound good? All right. For the, hopefully the last time this semester, if you're in steel design, let's pack up and let's go over there. <laughs> I'll see you in a few minutes.